It's pretty dark. Everyone else has their night vision on. I, mine's currently up because I'm looking through this. Uh, it's like a binocular, but it's shaped kind of funky. It, it, it's pretty stylized, like a remind me of like um like a Nighthawk aircraft. Really sharp lines. Looks really cool. So I'm looking through this thing again. It's dark out, and I look up the mountain and I see this really large heat signature for for the distance that it's at. In my mind, I thought, well, it's common for Taliban when they're moving from place to place, they'll kind of huddle up around a fire, throw a blanket around themselves, and they think that we can't see the fire, which we can, or we can't see them in general. So I, I take note of it and I say, well, maybe it's a goat farmer, maybe he just got stuck up there with his goats, you know, I'll just keep an eye on it. Kept looking around, looking around, and I looked back and I'm like, man, what is this thing? It's, it's one signature, which is odd, because usually You'll get a couple hot spots here and there when they're huddled up, but this is one solid thing. I'm like, man, what is this? When they're when it's up close and you can see the really defined lines of different temperatures. I mean, if, if I'm looking at someone's clothing, I'm seeing wrinkles in their clothing. I'm able to see creases. I mean, it's it's good stuff. It's very good. And on this object, I'm watching it for a good five, six minutes, just trying to figure out what's going on, looking around it to see if they, they're kicking out patrols or if I can see goats, just anything to give me context. And then all of a sudden this thing just stands up and the trees at that elevation are about 12 to 16 feet. And the tree that it was standing next to, it's just two, maybe three feet higher. Maybe three feet higher. The history of our Earth is so different from what we can imagine. Enjoy the giant. The Smithsonian, that if they found out about a large skeleton somewhere, was to go get it. I'm going to assume at least one person is right, because if one person's right, it busts the paradigm. It all goes back to the fallen chair. And the problem with the modern day church, they have a very truncated view of the supernatural. This backdrop that's just pregnant with all kinds of meaning associated with this Mount Hermon event. What are the creatures? Creatures. And this guy defects from the kingdom. That's a big deal. <laughs> All right, Luke, I love this one. This one's going to be fun. Welcome to Blurry Creatures, everyone out there. You know, we've been doing this a long time. You know, we've been we've hearing a lot of stories over the years about giants. We've heard a lot of secondary accounts where, you know, a guy knew a guy and told a story about military running into these things. And that's a bulk of what we talked about on our podcast in the beginning was, you know, Bigfoot's cool and all, but where does, how do you make sense of Bigfoot? You got to go back to the, the original Blurry Creatures, which is the, the Old Testament giants and all the weird stuff that went on there. And, you know, there's rumors all the time of people having encounters with these things today. And we've, we've, we've tapped in a little bit of that. But again, it's just like secondhand accounts, man. And so this is like the, you know, like the story of the Kandahar giant, you know, the. You no, know, it's, it's fascinating though, right? Because this is, you know, there's a very famous story that most, probably all of our listeners are, are familiar with of the Kandahar giant and the body being flown out in the C-130. Uh, this is not that story. This is a this is a different encounter in the same wild area of uh, areas of Afghanistan, not in Kandahar but in the Kunar region. And very exciting mm. to have you know to have Shane on to talk about what he saw. I, I think these are exceedingly rare. We talked about this with Kevin to see Nephilim, a, a, a giant. Yeah, is not is not like seeing a Bigfoot, right? You know, we've we've got maps. Of thousands Human of million. people having signs of the Bigfoot, we don't have that when it comes to, to giants. So, yeah, definitely, definitely looking forward to the, to this. This is like Christmas come early. Yeah, obviously, like one thing leads to another on our show. And if you've seen something strange that fits into, I don't know where to file this. Hit us up, Blurry Creatures Podcast at Gmail dot com. Come on down, send us your weird stuff. Maybe, maybe, just maybe, we'll ask you some questions about it here on the show. But if you want to become a member of the show, BlurryCreatures dot com slash members. A lot of new members coming in. Thank you so much for sponsoring the show. That's how Luke and I do this. We spend a lot of time finding these these episodes, building relationships, and then asking people to come on and, and trying to be as vulnerable and honest as possible. So a lot of that takes time and effort and work. And then we got to spend the time editing them, putting them to music, get, taking out all the fluff, 
get you the good stuff so that you can just sit there and listen for an hour, hour and a half and not even think about it because you're just so mesmerized and you're taken into the story. All that takes time and effort, so that's how we do it with the members. And uh, a lot of people sponsor the, sh- sponsor the show, so thank you guys. But again, blurrycreatures.com slash members. And if you want a t-shirt, Luke will ship you one. I'm the shipper. That's it, man. You got a, uh, <laughs> got a den, got a den full of full of shirts and hoodies, and join up with all things blurry. Check it out. I'm grateful for all those that support. It allows us to do to do this thing, and to yeah. keep asking questions, be a little less dumb, yeah. a little less dumb. Let's get Shane on the podcast and. Talked to some police officers lately who had some encounters and then brought on Tales from the Grid Square. So it's cool to talk to some some more credible witnesses, you know, than just some average Joe out there in the bushes. So I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, absolutely. How much do you know about our show or what we do? Uh, maybe maybe it's all new to you. Uh, yeah, it's completely new to me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so we talk about creatures in the biblical context. So, you know, Luke and I kind of grew up in the church and kind of got thrown into the into the Bigfoot space. And there's a lot of podcasts out there that are trying to talk paranormal, but not a lot of people want to include the Bible. And then there's a lot of theology podcasts that don't want to include the paranormal. And we kind of started putting them together and we've had a lot of success, been doing it for about three years and it just gets weirder. But we talk a lot about giants on the show, like the historical context of giants. And, you know, we've had guys come on who, you know, L.A. Marzulli and Tim Alberino, who talked to the the pilot of AC-130 and said that, you know, there was this rumor of the Af- you know, Afghanistan giant, and then so... Kandahar. Yeah. So, you know, there's rumors about these things, and it's rare to actually get somebody who said, no, I I have more than just a story for you. So it's it's just, that's what we kind of do on our podcast, whether it's, you know, historical accounts or modern-day sightings. So that's, hopefully that brings you up to speed a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. That, that sounds right up my alley. It sounds perfect. So welcome, Shane. I don't know how much of, our, of your information you want to share. We can just call you Shane if that's fine, and we can even mess with your voice if you don't like the, if you don't want that out there either. I'm not worried about it. I, I've got. I'm just telling my story. I'm not trying to hide anything. So, because yeah. I remember when I watched those L.A. Marzulli documentaries, the, the pilot didn't even want to go on camera. Yeah, uh, you- I can understand that. Um, for me, in my experience, it wasn't really shared much at the time i kind of didn't believe what i saw at the time that i saw it it wasn't much of a um, cryptozoology follower or you know (laughs) believed in a lot of that stuff until after the fact and it's like okay i I need to come back to this later and and it was actually a coast to coast radio uh that kind of brought it all home for me Mm. yeah tell tell our listeners a little bit about yourself like your story your backstory as much as you want to share your details sure uh we'd love to hear it. yes my name is shane i grew up in new mexico in albuquerque i joined the army at 17 with my older brother went to basic fort benning georgia uh, as an infantryman i got stationed at fort hood texas with the first infantry division we actually stood up a a new unit there uh did some training for a couple years and i deployed to kunar province afghanistan in 2008, uh, July 2008. Yeah, so I was uh, when I when I by the time I got there, I was I was a specialist. We got promoted to corporal. I was a fire team leader and often did the role of like squad leaders and stuff like that, just because of our our lack of numbers that we had in our specific unit. I, it, it, we were pretty undermanned. So, so at this time, any paranormal stuff even on your radar? Oh, a hundred percent. Is it just? <laughs> Okay. Yeah. Now it is. So at the time, you know, it was just focused on training and stuff. I didn't really put much thought into it. I was 17. Didn't really care for the the world around me as, as much as I should have. But definitely after I deployed, I and seeing the things that I saw and uh, it definitely piqued my interest. And then I, I met my wife, who's who's a Native American here. She's both her families from two different Pueblos. And just hearing the stories that they were telling and and stuff like that really brought me in and then kind of did some stuff on my own looking into this and you know skinwalkers and bigfoot and we've got a lot of ufo stuff out here and her family just has stories upon stories of all this stuff mm. 
Yeah, I mean, it's funny how everyone kind of gets in baptized into the blurry verse is what is kind of what we call it. <laughs> yeah, and, and into into that to that we've had a few Native Americans on on the show, especially when you know we always talk about Nate is the John Redbird Dover who actually had an episode on Unsolved Mysteries in the last the last foray that they released, but. He talks a lot about all the crazy stuff that happens in reservations and stuff they see in the uh, the American Southwest. So you're kind of in in the the epicenter if you if you're from New Mexico. If I don't know if you're there currently, but it is uh, there's a lot of crazy stuff that happens in the Four Corners area, you know, and in the Southwest in general. For whatever reason, especially on reservations, there's a lot of wild things: UFOs, Bigfoot, Skinwalkers, all of the above, Wendigos. <laughs> yeah. It's a it's a crazy world. So you get deployed in, in, in two thousand eight to Afghanistan. You tell us a little bit about the region and stuff, like so we can kind of set the the stage for for your story. I spent a little time in Afghanistan, not in a military sense, but I went to, to Kabul for about ten days. And so, if you haven't seen it, it's hard to it's hard to explain sort of the rugged wild wildness of at least what I saw. And I wasn't even out out like where in the regions mm-hmm. you were in. Yeah, so Kunar province is a very mountainous area, tucked deep in the Hindu Kush Mountains, northeastern Afghanistan. I believe, I don't know for certain, but I believe Kabul is southeast of it, but don't quote me on that. I I, I never went there, never <laughs> got close, so it wasn't really a, a big deal for me. My area of operations was near the Pakistan borders. But yeah, as you said, it's a very rugged and tough land full of very tough people i've come to respect very deeply for just surviving in this environment steep mountains a lot of loose slate rocks that that make it very difficult to to navigate and somehow they thrive there Hmm. yeah so for our listeners who don't know your story was on tales from the grid square when we had him on the show if you haven't listened to that episode go back and listen to tales of grid the grid square episode and then uh we thought, man, it'd be great to hear this straight from you. So thanks for coming on and, and, and recounting this uh, this encounter for us. Yeah, maybe give our listeners like kind of the, like a backstory of like what like that day, the day you had your encounter, and just all the details, anything you can remember leading up to to what you saw. Absolutely, yeah. So it, I believe I'm trying to remember the month. It had to have been somewhere around April or May of 2009. Uh, towards the end of the deployment, we we were pulled out in late June. Um, we were sent on an observation patrol. We're looking for an IED maker. Uh, a couple of weeks prior, I had spotted a uh, from an observation post up on top of one of the mountains. I'd spotted a guy planting an IED. We are able to successfully retrieve it. No one got hurt. So that was pretty cool. And so this was kind of a follow-up to that mission. And as we're heading out the gate, this was a uh, We were currently stationed. We were moving around from base to base. We were currently stationed at FOB Blessing. And as we're heading out the gate, one of our intel sergeants came out and said, hey, we got this new equipment. It's called the Recon 3. It's supposed to be some really great stuff. Why don't you guys check it out? We don't really have training on it, but play with it, figure it out, pass along the information, and then, you know, we kind of learn as you go. So. Mm-hmm. My uh, my lieutenant gave it to me and said, you know, figure out what you can. I said, all right, sounds good. Uh, we got up there. It was about, it was probably just after nightfall. Uh, it was a night patrol. So we got into our position and I'm looking around with this thing. And I, it, it's just the clarity of the image is, is amazing. It's a thermal imaging system. It's got incredible digital zoom. It's probably the coolest, one of the coolest pieces of uh, non-combatant equipment that I've, I've ever had my hands on. Mm. And uh, so I'm looking around, I'm looking cross Valley, which is a probably a mile, mile and a half away from me. And I'm seeing things very clearly. And then I, I look up the spur that we're on and I see a heat signature at the top of this, uh, this ridge line. Range estimation, probably between 600 and 750 meters or yards, as us Americans say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, time of, what time of day is this? So this is this is nighttime. It's pretty dark. Everyone else has their night vision on. I mine's currently up because I'm looking through this. Uh, it's like a binocular, but it's it's shaped kind of funky. It, it, it's pretty stylized, like a remind me of like um like a Nighthawk aircraft. Mm. Really sharp lines. Looks really cool. Yeah. Um, so I'm looking through this thing again, it's dark out and I look up the mountain and I see this really large heat signature for, for the distance that it's at. 
in my mind, I thought, well, it's common for Taliban when they're moving from place to place, they'll kind of huddle up around a fire, throw a blanket around themselves, and they think that we can't see the fire, which we can, or we can't see them in general. So I, I take note of it and I say, well, maybe it's a goat farmer. Maybe he just got stuck up there with his goats. You know, I'll just keep an eye on it. Kept looking around, looking around, and I look back. And I'm like, man, what is this thing? It's it's one signature, which is odd, because usually you'll get a couple hot spots here and there when they're huddled up. But this is one solid thing. I'm like, man, what is this? I think most of the Bigfoot communities used to like the FLIR cameras where it's just like a blob. Mm -hmm. Is this like next level? Is that what does that look? What does it look like? Yeah. So it's close to FLIR. It's like FLIR when they're when it's up close and you can see the really defined lines of, of different temperatures i mean if if i'm looking at someone's clothing i'm seeing wrinkles in their clothing i'm able wow. to see creases i mean it's it's good stuff it's very good mm. and on this object i'm watching it for a good five six minutes just trying to figure out what's going on looking around it to see if they they're kicking out patrols or if i can see goats just anything to give me context and then all of a sudden this thing just stands up and the trees at that elevation are about 12 to 16 feet. And the tree that it was standing next to, it's just two, maybe three feet higher. Wow. So immediately terror sets in. Oh, man. Because <laughs> I have no idea what this is. And I keep thinking, oh, it's got to be a human just closer. And it's a weird bush. It, you know, I'm trying to rationalize this in my head. And none of that is checking out. What I'm seeing is something that's extremely lanky, doesn't appear to have clothing on. Um, its groin area kind of seemed weird. It's the best I could describe it because I'm not exactly used to looking at naked people with <laughs> thermal vision. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what to expect, but it's kind of it's on par with the rest of its body. It's just a, a one consistent creature. Oh, human though. Yeah, definitely humanoid. Looks like it had a, a bushy beard, long hair on top. It looked hairy, but not like an ape. So like more more human and, le- and less squatchy. Yeah, yeah. He definitely had some uh, some Robin Williams-esque hair to him. I mean, he's he's a burly, whatever this thing was, was very burly and had a good coat, but not quite. But naked. Yeah. But great lettuce. Just good. Oh, just yeah. good great <laughs> lettuce. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he's not cold at night. But yeah, I mean, but for people out there, Sasquatch, I mean, rarely do they get him over... Maybe ten feet, eleven's tops. You don't really hear about Sasquatch being fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. That just doesn't happen. You don't hear him that big. Yeah, and, and the other thing that caught my attention is so it, it, as it stood up, I mean, it's looking in our direction, which was also pretty creepy for the distance that we're at. I don't know if anyone's ever tried to spot a person at six hundred yards or six hundred meters, but it's it's not easy. It's we're a speck at that that distance, and it's. Yeah. Looking generally at us, I can't see facial features or anything like that, but I could definitely tell that it's in our general area and it's fixed on around where we are. Mm. Yeah, it was it was pretty trippy. I first thing that went through my mind after I was like, nah, maybe it's just a guy. He's closer than I expect. I pull it down to pull on my night vision, and I'm like, no, that distance is way too damn far. That doesn't make any sense. Flip the night vision back up, pull up the uh, recon threes again, and I'm looking at it again. And just I, I can't make sense of it. And how big is it sitting down? You think you said you were looking at it for like five or six minutes. Yeah, so it was it was crouched in a traditional. I don't know if you ever look at like how Middle Eastern and uh, in India when they crouch, they just do kind of a deep squat with their knees spread out. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's similar to how it was posturing. That's why I thought it was just a local at, originally or a group of locals potentially, and just at a closer distance than I expected. But I would say it, it was probably, I'm six foot two, and the tree was the best reference that I had next to it. They have pretty short trunks, maybe five to six feet. It was as tall as as that, so it's about five to six feet tall, crouched. But there again, it's a good distance, so it's hard to tell. It just, it was, it's still massive. Are you, are you alone, Shane, when you're... Oh, like is this like a watch that you're on by yourself? Is, did anyone else see this when you're no. when you see it? Okay, yeah. So we're uh, on the patrol. We probably we were pretty understaffed and undermanned. So we probably had ten, maybe twelve people on the patrol. I was kind of at the highest area. The next guy was maybe uh, thirty feet away from me, ten yards or so. Okay. So and and this thing just start. You feel like it's looking. Mm-hmm. In, in your direction and then do you just watch this thing is it is it what what happens next 
Yeah. So I, I look at it as it stands up. Cause at first I'm still trying to figure out what this thing is. It doesn't make sense to me. Then it stands up and I go, that's yeah. one thing. <laughs> that's, that's a giant creature. And we've seen some giant animals that you wouldn't expect to be in this area. Like we've seen large lizards that are four, four feet long, some weird spiders, crickets. Like it seems like everything in this general area is just bigger. Texas ain't got nothing on, on the Kunar <laughs> province. <laughs> so as it stands up, it turns and walks away from me. And the distance that it clears in such a casual stride is so fast. And it does it with ease. And it just, it's gone before I know it. So I probably saw it take 10, 15 steps. It went over to the next ridge. I lost sight of it and that was it. And so I kind of sat back and and contemplated what I saw. And I thought, did I just fall asleep? You know, am I hallucinating? Because we're not getting good sleep or anything. We're doing two patrols a day. And I I can't make sense of it. So I was the only one who saw it. And I'm, I'm sitting here trying to rationalize it. And it's not something that can be rationalized. So yeah, so what do you what do you do then? Do you do you talk to anybody in the in the platoon? Do you talk to any of your Yeah, I mean like you you sit there, I, I can imagine like anybody who's had like an experience, there's this probably like dumbfounded rationalization where you try to explain it to yourself. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, that wasn't that, that wasn't this, that definitely was you know. Mm-hmm. Or like you're saying, like, oh, we haven't slept or you know, am I just am I loopy, you know, am yeah. I am I hallucinating from lack of sleep? And so you go through this process and then you know, where do you land at, at that point? So I didn't bring it up to anybody, especially none of my guys. I didn't want anyone to think I was off my rocker because it's <laughs> end of deployment. Right. We've had our issues within the platoon. We're already short guys. Like, I'm not trying to get pulled off because I'm telling crazy stories, you know. But a couple days later, I, I, I approached my lieutenant. And we had a pretty good relationship at the time. And I said, hey, sir, you know, the other day when I w- we were on that patrol, we set in. This is what I saw. I told him everything that I saw. And I said, I can't, can you help me make sense of this? Cause I don't really want to go to anyone else. And he was, he sat there and he said, well, did you take a picture of it? And I said, well, how could I do that? And he said, there's a picture functionality on the recon three. Uh, I was like, why did you tell me that, sir? Like, what the hell, oh, man? man? Yeah. I could have got a ton of pictures. It's like, oh, it was just the most heartbreaking thing. And it, and as we talked about it, he, he mentioned something about, you know, there was a, a weird SF patrol that came through. Uh, we'd often get some special forces guys coming through our area. Uh, they would stay at our, our base. Sometimes we would help them out in little ways, but usually they're just, you know, hey, they're going to show up and they're going to leave when they want. They come when they want. They do what they want. Just let, let them be. He said they mentioned they had a weird mission, but wouldn't go into details. And he said it was just odd the way that they are reacting to the information that they had and their objective there. Mm-hmm. So that's what came to his mind. And so I thought, well, maybe there's something more to this. And then uh, kind of life went on after that. And I I didn't really bring it up to anybody again, because I, I still at that time wasn't big into paranormal, supernatural, cryptozoology. None of that really was piqued my interest or did any research. Yeah, I was going to say, because like a lot of hunters have the similar experience, you know, they're out hunting, they've been hunting their whole life, they see it. But I think a lot of hunters have an idea. Of, they've heard about Sasquatch. They've heard about Bigfoot. So by the time they see, maybe they have an encounter, it's probably not as jarring because you're like, oh, I mean, it's it still probably freaks you out because you're actually seeing it, but it you have some frame, frame of reference. Mm-hmm. And then you see something like 18, 20 feet tall in the middle of the... Yeah, how, wait, how, t- how tall did you, Shane, for Nate? What do you think? Like, is it that tall? 16 to 18. 16 to 18. Yeah. Six, that, I, I feel comfortable saying 16 to 18, maybe smaller, that's maybe, huge. but that's about right. Yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah. it's jabiguous. And like I said, the way that it cleared that ground is what scared me the most. It's like, man, this thing is just... Yeah. What was the stride like? It wasn't... It was... it seemed a little squatchy just with the the kind of the lumbering arms it was more i don't know how to describe that like the the swaying of the arms was similar to a lot of the sasquatch videos i see kind of straight armed not really human like it seems a little off but the the linkiness of the legs it was just so sure footed and i mean this this terrain as i said before it's all loose rock i mean even the locals are making noise as they go through and they're slipping every once in a while. Mo- for the most part, they're pretty sure-footed, but this thing just with that, with ease, just kind of walked away mm. very quickly and with l- 
zero effort. Do you remember exactly where you are? Were like you could see it on Google Maps or something? Yeah, I could. I could pull it up on Google Maps. That'd be cool to maybe throw it out to some of our members to check out wh- exactly where this happened. And after the fact, if you want to send that to us, I'd love to see the terrain. I'm sure some of our listeners yeah. would too. Yeah, absolutely. So you. So the total encounter was probably what sounds around like almost 10 minutes or a little about less? 10 maybe 15 minutes because uh, like i said when i first saw it i, th- I just kind of logged that away and said oh maybe it's a sheep herder up there not too concerned about it i'm not seeing any other signs of anything so uh, i'm just going to take a look at that later and kind of conduct our mission as we were supposed to uh using the recon threes mm. um and then the whole i probably watched it to figure out what it was two or three minutes it stood up and walked away. So in that period, it was probably four, maybe five minutes total. That's wild. Man. Do you think, in your opinion, do you think that, that some of what the SF guys were doing there had to do with potentially something like this? Yeah. So what what really triggered this memory for me, uh, like I said, I had already got out of the Army. This is about 2010. I was just driving. I used to drive around the desert a lot and just get my truck and kind of cruise out, listen to um, Coast to Coast Radio that evening. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Big fan. Uh, and this guy called in and he was the C-130 pilot that said he had that, you know, red haired, fire haired giant, two rows of teeth, six fingers and toes and all that stuff. And I, th- I believe if I remember correctly, I could be wrong because I've read a lot of different accounts since then. But I believe he said it was around the time that I was there, 2008 to 2009. And so that just kind of it all kind of flooded back to me at that time. And it's like, oh, man, I, th- I think that's what I saw. And that doesn't sound like Bigfoot to me. It sounds more like a Nephilim. I mean, this is an ancient land that we're in. This is, and in this specific area, there's also weird things that the locals did that we didn't quite pick up on. We were more mission focused. So we didn't think to like stop and ask like, hey, why why are you dyeing your goats orange? Why are you dyeing your hair orange? What's up with that? You know, we didn't, that's not a a Muslim tradition that I'm aware of. And I do have some pictures of, uh, of them dyeing their goats orange. And then those goats would be gone. So it's like, well, did you sacrifice it? Because that's not really something that I'm aware that Muslims do, given I'm not Islamic or anything. But I became pretty familiar with with the religion while there. Mm. That's what we had. Nick Nick was talking about on Tales from the our Tales from the Grid Square episode. Nick was saying that you know he 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 read a couple of stories about yeah. that. Mm-hmm. It's a really weird thing when it's like not not religiously affiliated or culture it doesn't seem to be culturally affiliated that there's this sort i mean you can Mm -hmm. you can postulate a lot that there's some sort of it's a reverence thing or a it's just it's fascinating to me it's like it sounds like an offering yeah like leave us alone we'll give you our goats yeah take the orange ones you orange haired people like just don't touch anything else please the orange ones are for you yeah (laughs) (laughs) yeah yeah and we've and we've talked a lot on our show shane about how they you know the orange, the the Paracas skulls had orange hair, and there was rumored of orange haired giants all over the all over the planet, not just <laughs> yeah, in Love Afghanistan. Cave. So it, but yeah, so it's 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 something that they have they have this in common, I and mean, it's not always, but it seems to be that that's a familiar story. All, all, obviously, the six fingers, six toes, mm-hmm. and double rows of teeth, and all that other stuff. And then like, I guess they sound terrible if you can if you ever have an encounter with one. But uh, I mean, after that, did you talk to anybody else besides your you know, your higher ups and did you look into anything else in the area? Any more clues that they could kind of give you context of like this, yeah, I saw this. I saw this this creature. Do you think they do you have any theories? Like did it go underground or did it was it living there? What are your thoughts? I I definitely think it's living there. I mean, so these are there's a lot of caves here. Um, it's a very rugged mountain area. So I would assume there's giant cavern somewhere but nothing that we really saw i've seen a couple small ones um on different patrols but at the elevation that they're at we don't usually have much reason to be up there so i don't know what the terrain's like up there i would assume that there's plenty of places for it to to thrive in and never to to or to hardly ever be seen i mean it had it not been for this huge technology thermal device I would never have mis- I would never have seen it with my normal night vision. I wouldn't have seen it with most anything else. I mean, it it, it was very, very far away. Do you think? I want to ask you then. Do you do you think it, mm-hmm. it's? I think it saw you. I do. Do you think it knew you were there? That's crazy to think about. That's because it was scary. You, what, the, the two things there, right? The juxtaposition of like you would have no idea. You know, us you know, regular human mm-hmm. humans, like we have no idea. It's you know seven seven hundred fifty yards, seven hundred fifty meters away, and 
it's almost it's crazy. It sounds like it, it's like a movie, right? You're like this thing yeah. stands up and it looks. It shouldn't be able to, but it looks at you. You know, it's like right. you, can, you can picture this happening. It, I've heard the same thing with Sasquatch encounters, Shane. Like hunters will be looking at them through the scope. They don't they don't get what they're looking at, and then Sasquatch will look at them through and like they'll and they'll it'll catch them off guard because. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's far away. There's no way this thing can see you, but it, it's almost like it's looking right at you. I, I've heard the same thing with Sasquatch encounters. It, I definitely had the feeling that it knew that I was there. Mm-hmm. When I realized it, when it stood up is when I, the first time I realized there's one thing, one creature, not a bunch of things huddled together. I, I'm not afraid to say that I was terrified. And I definitely had, you know, a lot of thoughts of like, we need to get the hell off this mountain now. Uh, that we're not stopping this thing. Whatever it is, if it chose to become hostile, we're in trouble unless we have some serious, uh, some jets on station, helicopters or something. I was, I was scared, and I, I felt very, very uncomfortable and threatened, and, and that was not a common feeling for me. I mean, I, we felt very much at home in those mountains at that point. We've been there almost a year and saw a lot of, a lot of combat, and it's like, yeah, we're, we're fine. You kind of had that untouchable mentality and stuff, but man, that, that was not something I was willing to mess with. Do you think our military is in some of these places because they have intel on some of these creatures? I do. Uh, I've heard of that special forces uh, patrol that was apparently, you know, they came in contact with them after I think some rangers went missing. I'd have to pull up the exact example. I can't remember names or anything, but I guess the story goes that they found a cave. Uh, some rangers went by and went, they all went missing. No comms. So the SF went out there to retrieve them and they came across this cave and there's three or four of them with spears and they fought them off and they were able to kill one and that's where that body and that body was recovered i believe that was the kandahar giant yeah, uh yeah. if i'm not mistaken but again i have i have looked this up a lot so i have different stories some ring a little more true than others and and i'm i'm at heart a skeptic i believe that all this stuff exists but i don't typically believe a lot of people's stories i guess it depends on how it's told yeah. but you're doing a good definitely job Definitely, that one seems jello thank you <laughs> <laughs> i'm skeptical of myself like i said at that time i didn't talk about it for two days and after that i don't think i mentioned it to anybody until after i got out and i think it was more of the environment i was in i didn't know that anyone would believe me because i don't know that i believe me yeah. it's like there's no way i saw what i saw mm. yeah i mean it takes a while to same thing happened to me i was a kid i saw something and then it wasn't until years later that i actually was like no i think i saw that and because I heard other people kind of coming out and saying, yeah, this, this, I saw this creature and it, I don't know why that is about human beings, but it takes us some time to process after the fact and then believe our own stories. Right. We've interviewed a lot of experts on the show who say that, you know, especially with people getting abducted by, mm-hmm. you know, at night they're, they go to sleep and they, this crazy story happens. They float out the window, they get taken into some craft and then they have to process this. And, and a lot of times it's like, there's nobody will believe them. I mean, that, I mean, that's. Mm-hmm. That's difficult for people who experience these things, especially if you see something that's 18, 15, 18 feet tall. It's not a it's not a bear. Yeah. You know, a lot of people write off the Sasquatch phenomenon. Oh, it's just a bear. You just saw something. And then, and then the hunters are like, I swear it was not a bear. I've been in the forest my whole life. I know this thing. But this is hard because it's and you can't blame it on anything. It's either there's a giant in the desert <laughs> or I'm losing my mind. You know, that's it. Those are the two options. Right. Yeah. So what do you think about the Kanahar giant story? You, you, you were kind of getting into it. You, you said you were kind of skeptical, but you believe parts of it. Um, you think it's a legit. So that story, I, I fully buy in. There's other stories of, of giants that I've, I've seen from people and the way they talk about the situation they were in. Usually it's military stuff. And the way that they're presenting the, how their patrol was going doesn't make sense to me. Mm. Uh, and so it kind of draws that cloud of skepticism. It's like, I'll hear what you have to say, but I'm going to take it with a grain of salt. And obviously I know something's out there. So you very well could have seen it, but some of the things you're saying just don't quite add up. Mm-hmm. Seems a little, little fishy, but at the, the whole Kandahar story, I, f- I fully believe, you know, I don't, I don't know where you guys fall in all this, but uh, I would assume with dealing with supernatural stuff that I don't have a lot of faith that the government is really out for the best of us. They kind of want to figure, find this stuff and keep it for their own uh, in, intelligence and whatever benefits they can get from it. And I'm a, I'm also a Christian. So, you know, the men of renown were, were spoke about in Genesis and mm-hmm. I'm not big on the dead sea scrolls, but I know that the giants were talked about then obviously Goliath was a giant. So it makes sense that this kind of area of the world, there could still be these fallen beings. I mean, 
the flood was supposed to take him out, but clearly it didn't. Mm. Or they came back. Yeah. Yeah. Satan is a powerful adversary. That's right. On our on our show, we've uncovered Shane. That they're all over the place. They're mm-hmm. all they're they're off the coast of islands all over the world. They are in America, building mounds here, doing all kinds of stuff. And you know, for a long time, the newspapers would report digging them up. Mm-hmm. Farmers were digging them up, and we make jokes about it on our show just because it's so so many times the same story, right? The Smithsonian shows up, steal the bones, this and that. But this is why you're, I think your story is so important because you see this in the modern day times and. There are still people out there who have encounters with these things. We've heard stories of them being in the swamps of Louisiana to Mm -hmm. around like the Solomon Islands and Southeast Asia, just places like that where not a lot of people go. And they're they're exceedingly rare. I mean, because there are thousands and thousands of of Bigfoot sightings, right, Nate? I mean, those are... Yeah. That has become a cultural phenomenon in a lot of ways because people are having encounters. But to have an encounter with a a giant or a Nephilim or, or... Whatever it is you want to you want to name it, a giant humanoid. Those are very few and far between. Yeah, they, they, they said the Solomon Islands. There are lots of stories about them out there. We actually talked to a to a woman who did human trafficking work in Thailand, and there were stories from remote Thai villages about a giant that was trafficking women. And then you know they have the Afghanistan stories, like like Nate said that there's, but it's very very rare. But they're they're still it's still there. I mean, for us, we hear about this, and we're in this nerd nerdy <laughs> part of you know alternate history so we're into it right but for the rest of the people there they think you're nuts yeah. they think it's crazy but we don't yeah i've been i've been waiting yeah it was, it was nice that in meeting my my wife i so i met her after the military um it was nice to hear them tell stories before i told any of mine and then to also experience like the house we live in right now is actually used to be her grandparents and this this house is haunted like there's no wow. if ands or buts i had zero experience with possessions hauntings anything like that i came to this house when we were just friends as uh to watch a ufc fight and something in here spiritually challenged me and it was wow. it was terrifying i had no idea how to feel i had no idea what to think or what it was but man i was in fight mode and it was i was ready to go and it was like why am i ready to go with this with this house party for with, with her family you know and and so we eventually like everybody had stories about this house and stuff like that so it kind of got me more comfortable with like, okay, so there's, there's some uh, familiarity with spirit, with spiritual things, supernatural things uh, in this family. So I can actually open up about some of my stuff and then they start pouring on theirs. And it's like, man, I'm, you know, I'm, I've found a home here for this story mm. and I feel validated and understood and believed it's, it was, it was refreshing. Cause I, I, I was, I was scared of telling anybody until, you know, I was able to tell her family so much and they're like, Oh man, tell that story to this person. And they haven't heard it. It's like, cool. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no, I love it. It, it. it really helps a lot of people um, believe sort of their own suppressed history. Right. So they don't, you know, you hear this, this newspaper accounts, there's thousands and thousands of accounts of these things being dug up. Right. Mm-hmm. So sometimes Shane, they're in the 18, 19, you know, these skeletons were massive that they're, these were farmers were reporting digging up. Mm-hmm. And even in this field, there's skeptics like, oh, they didn't get that big. And I'm like, well, who's to say? Like, you believe to this one spot and then you won't go any further? Like, why Why couldn't they get 20 foot? Why couldn't they get 30? I don't know. But it's funny. It's, it's it, But it's good to hear it from you because I think it helps people. Actually, the crazy things we hear on our show, they go, OK, the world is weirder than we thought. And this stuff is still still out there. And there's a lot of Christians who are like paralyzed about this topic they'll just make hard draw hard lines there's no more of this stuff going on you're crazy you're conspiracy theorist and all this other stuff and it's it's sad because uh i think it really helps embolden a lot of people's faith when you plug in the genesis 6 story that humans and and angels made it and they created these Mm -hmm. things it really helps you understand the old testament and what was going on all the weirdness and all the wars and all the fighting and all the the cataclysms all the stuff and Mm-hmm. And on our show, we're, we we love it. We go into it. We talk about it. And so it's just very, like Luke said, it's very rare to hear someone have a modern day sighting of one of these things. But I know it happens. It's just, I'm sure people don't want to talk about it. I mean, I was thinking about this as you're sitting there, you know, we're, we're in this modern warfare setting where we have all this technology and, and advanced weaponry. And it makes me think about, you know, you seeing that and the terror that you relayed and seeing that when, when you have these, this advanced weaponry, right. And then you think about the biblical story and, 
And, and you see, think about the Israelites with you know spears and swords running into these things running around in in, in Canaan and mm-hmm. slingshots. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, it is a great tapestry context, I think, for understanding the biblical story as well. And then I just think it brings it to life. Like you talk about the encountering of supernatural things. I, you know, Paul talks a lot about that in the New Testament. How the things that we are unseen are more real than the things we do see. And yet I, I do believe, as Nate said, that a lot of times mm-hmm. there's a lot of factions and, and, and circles in, in, in the modern Christianity that, that say that there is no more supernatural. God doesn't do anything supernatural anymore. You know, there's no more mir- miracles and this stuff is, mm-hmm. you know, or they, or they just don't feel like addressing, you know, the spiritual aspect of you know, what people call supernatural or it, mm-hmm. it's like reading one page of, of, of a book. It's like you, you there's no context to it. So I, I just, I love these, to hear these accounts because it's just credibility to chasing the truth, right? And I think you have a very interesting point about the government as well, not wanting mm-hmm. to kind of keep this canned up. And at the same time, it sounds like we are sending, you know, we as say the United States are sending, you know, some of our elite fighting force to, to, to the corners of the earth to, to vanquish, collect, whatever you want to call it, some of this remnant of, to just ancient gnarliness. I don't know how else to put it. That's crazy. Yeah. I do like ancient gnarliness. That, yeah, that seems yeah. to fit pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> like you said, it, you know, it, it, it is funny. I had never really considered that, but you know, for David to go up against one of these things with a sling and some river rocks, it's like, man, yeah. I had, I had my M4 with my grenade launcher. I had 10 other guys. We got a couple machine guns, more grenade launchers, if we needed, we got get some artillery or mortars on station pretty quickly, which was pretty common for us. Or there's probably aircraft in the area, but still, it's like, man, I don't, I don't want this fight. <laughs> right. This is not one that I want. I, I don't know what this is. I don't know what it's capable of. And you know, the the army typically teaches uh, you do a three to one ratio uh, when getting into a fight. You want to have us three to their one. And it's like, man, this is one to ten or twelve, and this is not this is not optimal. There's things that are bigger than us as humans on the planet, right? There, you get elephants, you get animals that are that are more formidable. You know, even if you get in the water, there's bigger things than us. But things that aren't like sentient, like in the sense of like you know, highly intelligent humanoid, mm-hmm. it's just fascinating to think like to feel small. I, I think maybe that's that's what I'm, I'm imagining, like to feel a lot smaller than something that looks somewhat like us, but is massively bigger. And we would assume just as as hyper intelligent. It, it, yeah. It, yeah, like you said, like David, or even like Caleb and the spies going to the promised land and coming back and saying, "There's like there's giants here," you know, and they're like, "We could take them." I, I just <laughs> it's, it's you know, I, I <laughs> dude, it is. It, you have a unique you have a unique point of view with that because you sat across from one. Mm-hmm. There's these like hyper skeptics in this community too who are like. You know, they take the word Nephilim, they break it down, they go through all the texts, and they're like, you know, we can't assume these are giants, right? And it's really frustrating to a lot of guys who are like in this space who are trying to see that, you know, this knowledge is being suppressed, like you said. Mm -hmm. They don't want this to come out. They don't want to come out culturally, biblically, historically, contextually. They don't want any knowledge of this because it really throws a wrench into the whole narrative we've been taught our whole Mm -hmm. life. You know, if these if these giants were around back in the day, then this this whole evolution idea is just yeah. it's kind of garbage. It doesn't really make any sense, and I think that's a that's a big part of it. I don't think that's the only reason, but it's a huge part of it. And and where do you think that technology is now? Because this is 2008. You're seeing something. I I'm assuming the technology is just it's it's so much better even now that some of these guys are probably having more and more encounters with the weird. <laughs> blurry things out in the mountains you i think. would assume so so I, I know that one of the biggest uh technological differences between then and now is the the night vision that some of these units are getting that they're starting to roll out has thermal built in as well uh which was not something that we had we just had some stuff probably from the 90s it wasn't in great condition and it did its job but it, nothing was very clear uh, night combat didn't happen often but when it did it was pretty fuzzy but now with that kind of, I, I can't imagine what's being seen. And I wonder if that would have been seen with a normal, you know, one power thermal optic at that range for that size. Because I would assume like a lot of times it's pretty fascinating actually with a lot of this, uh, this technology. Uh, we, we could see a guy from two miles away smoking a cigarette on our normal standard issue night vision. And it's like, it's like a star is on the ground. 
if you're looking cross valley two miles away the guy lights up a cigarette takes a puff it's like man you're lighting up that whole area it's yeah. it's easy to see so i don't know what the capabilities of these new uh goggles are but i i could imagine that you know they're seeing trippy stuff all the time and you know probably like me it's like man i can't let the guys know that i'm crazy here because <laughs> this stuff is never talked about so especially as a leader i don't want anyone questioning me and yeah. saying hey you know you know shane over here he's uh he's losing it man totally yeah well it shows up on the thermal which i think is important you know a lot of these skinwalker type things you know some people say they tend to they tend to be more of a spiritual entity, sort of a, mm-hmm. you know, and I don't know if they interact with our technology the same way, but this is like a flesh and blood physical creature. So do you think there's like a breeding population out there? I would assume there'd have to be. I'm very interested in, in uh, you know, Old Testament people living to 600, 900 years old. Yeah. And if these are fallen angelic beings, offspring, I would assume they would have some longevity there. And so- how many there might be, I don't know. And how old this thing was is something that I think about often is, you know, if this is some descendant of an angel, or a, I guess they would be a demon now. Um, right. Well, they were angels at the time, whatever. I think that's why the government's after them. It's like, you've got some higher spiritual DNA here that's available. Let's, re, you know, reverse engineer it. Let's figure it out. Super, you know, all the super sol- soldier serum stuff. And it's like, I'm a full believer that that's, that's all they want is they want control. How do you get control? Well, you have these big giants on your side or you create these big giants and, yeah. you know, men will come from, from afar to say, Hey, I want to be big and strong like that. Make me that I'll, I'll serve you. If you, if you give that to me and, you know, it, and, and also the spiritual aspect of it is, you know, it, men are weak and we're tempted and we were greedy and you know that it just kind of fits in with my theology of all of how all that works and how it's being used against us yeah a, we talk a lot about transhumanism on our show for sure and that's that that falls right in line with all the things we're hearing about the genetic upgrades mm-hmm. and, it's also it's also like Nate, it's also interesting like to hear Shane talk about that because we did that episode about the tombs of the god kings right where mm-hmm. there's a hypothesis and there's a there's a there's a line of thought about the fact that there are actively within within our military and, and within that co- industrial complex that they're looking for the tombs of some of these god kings like Nimrod, right, the Gilgamesh, and and, and how that coincided with, mm-hmm. you know, hold on, you know, listen, but like the the Gulf War, like the invasion of of Iraq, that they there was this discovery of this tomb of Gilgamesh and Gilgamesh and Nimrod are assumed to be the same, and Nimrod, from the biblical account, we know that he became a mighty man and so that falls into it too like there's these it it almost feels like indiana jones and so it sounds a little crazy to say out loud but there's (laughs) these ideas they're looking for these ancient Mm -hmm. tools and ancient dna these relics that may have dna in order to access or unlock like you had said to to build a super soldier and in the same way i think like nate was saying they're doing that there's this whole push for transhumanism you know, to upgrade DNA, you know, and it's, it feels under the guise of like, we can turn genes off for cancer and we can cure X, Y, Z. But when you get into playing God, it's, it's never really about that ever. It's always about right. domination and dominion and subduing humanity, honestly. And that, that's what we saw with, you know, in the golden age with the, with the, the, the creation of the Nephilim and the fallen of the angels and their angelic offspring. It was a subdue humanity, right? And then God wiped mm-hmm. wiped the earth with with the flood. And mm-hmm. the Bible was very specific about the end days being like the days of Noah. And it's it's not surprising to me. It's so it's it's really interesting to hear you say that too, because you know I know there's a ton we don't know, and you know people talk about this in the terms of the UFO stuff too, Nate. Where you know do they have craft? What are they doing with these craft? Well, they're they're holding on to it. They're reverse engineering it. And, you know, in the same way, they're it feels like they're looking. For that advanced technology, in order to build the weapons for a super army, and yeah. you can you can easily rabbit trail rabbit hole into like mm-hmm. you know the armies of Mordor and all this kind of kind of <laughs> sort of idea, right? But it's yep. perhaps that's yeah, what's happening. It, it's hard to not branch off from uh, stuff like this. Like I, you know, when I was in the military, I wasn't as skeptical of the government, but I was also young and dumb, so. You know, as I got out and I started diving into this kind of stuff, it's like, man, you know, this UFO stuff seems a little fishy here. Let let me look into this a little more. What do I Mm -hmm. think it is? You know, and and then you just start going down this rabbit hole of, wow, you know, man really is bad as well, for the most part. And especially at higher levels when power is involved and 
And, you know, like you said, like the, the flood was, it was very clear as to why the flood happened. It was to, to rid the world of these things. And they still were there and they're still, in, you know, hearing stories from Native American cultures and stuff. It's like, man, they were literally everywhere and known. Yeah. You know, it, mm-hmm. I, I think that's why it's not discussed in the Bible as much because it was like, yeah, there's there's just giants there. Why would it? Well, how come they don't talk about dogs as much in the Bible? Well, because it's a common thing that you don't need to really speak about. Right. It wouldn't occur to you, you know. And so it's, mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I've definitely gone deep down like conspiracy rabbit holes and stuff. And and I'm a I'm a I'm a believer, but skeptic at the same time, which I think is probably the right way to go. Yeah, absolutely. What I like about your encounter too is there's like some details that help make sense from a lot of the other you know people who've been down these rabbit holes because there's always there's tales of guys like Magellan mm. who you know had encounters with Patagonia down in those parts of the world where they had these these historical accounts in like the 14, 13, 14, 1500s where these ex- early explorers were seeing giants mm. you know living in these parts of the world and and that you know the natives are saying that the stuff that was created and built around these areas was not built by Mm -hmm. humans. It was built by dynasties before, but the way you describe this, this thing is almost like kind of some of those accounts where they're, they kind of act like they're not as domesticated. Mm -hmm. I would say they it's sort of like they're, they're humanoid, but there's still, there's like this primitive part Mm -hmm. almost. Right. And there's a lot of accounts in native Americans fighting them here. And it's and it and it just feels like there's a primitive, but there's a couple of explorer ones like man, I, I I like some of these accounts where I remember there's one that stuck to me where these arrows were going through six inch oak trees. You know they're get to trying to get off the boat and they're getting shot at by these giants on the on the coast and they're going through these oak trees. And you got to think this got to be something massive if it's going to be able to pull back a, an arrow and shoot through that. You know and and you and you don't know what to do with these accounts because you're like that just sounds like a fairy tale. That just sounds. There's no way, you know, but if you look back in the history books, you see all kinds of weird stuff like this. And so to see one in the modern day, it, it really helps them give give all these other guys credibility because like not only were they around, but they are still around probably way less numbers. But they mm-hmm. they have this weird primitive human, you know, they're kind of human. They're kind of not. They're kind of it's almost like they they don't need all the bells and whistles that we do to survive. Mm-hmm. You know. Maybe they do live a long time. Maybe they do have that. Oh, it's like Captain Cook showing up in Easter Island, right? I mean, there's these, there's these pre, yeah, you know, pre 1930s, yeah, there pre 1930s accounts, and you can you can go back and through all of it of you know giant humans still humanoids or human like mm-hmm. things that are around, and you usually in remote areas. And like Nate said, they were here in North America and. I feel like they battle with the Native Americans and they were hunted. I mean, it's cool to hear a story, a modern day story about about lighting one up on a thermal and seeing and seeing something. That's a long encounter too. I mean, ten minutes is a long time. Yeah, yeah it felt long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, just, it just it just eliminates the idea that you saw something flicker, right? It, it's like you know you saw something and you saw it for a long time. It wasn't just like a something popped in the therm and then it was gone. Right. It was like there is. Something there. Absolutely. What do you think now? What do you think? Of, are you looking into these topics more? Are you trying to dig up more uh, accounts from military running into these things? Have you heard anything else? Is there anything, you know, since then? Yeah, since then, I've, I've definitely, it happened more when I first was started telling the story just because I thought, man, you know, there's got to be something else out there. Someone else has to have something. And so I dug in pretty deep, uh, 2011 ish. And uh, ever since then, I kind of keep my ear to the ground, and I'm I'm happy to tell the story to anybody and everybody. I'm not, I, I feel more confident in what I saw as opposed to the day I saw it. I haven't really come across anything that's not mainstream, I guess. Like the Kandahar giant stuff, like that's all pretty well known. If it's on coast to coast, it's well at least mainstream within the cryptozoology paranormal community. And my wife is all about the paranormal community. So we watch a lot of different things and listen to different podcasts. I actually haven't heard of yours, but I'll, we'll be checking it out. Thanks, man. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Um, I don't know. I just, I really hope that there's more people that do come out with uh, this information and, and share their story. If they saw what they saw. Cause at, at the same time, you know, I feel confident in what I saw, but there's still in the back of my mind, there's that little like, ah, man, that who am I to see something so grandiose as that, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a nobody. And why did I get to see this thing? You know, obviously God has a plan and everything happens for a reason, but why, why am I, 
why was I chosen to see this thing? And at that point in time and not know that there was a picture button and, you know, it's like all these things happen. It's like, dang it, man. Right. If I could go back. Yeah. Right. <laughs> You got a blurry photo. Yeah, but even if you took pictures, like we said, we interviewed a guy that was on that was on the Nimitz, and he said they took the videos, right? So uh, he, you know, they when they filmed that Tic Tac on the on the Nimitz, he said that they had they had better footage, and then you know, the, the Navy took it. Who yeah. knew? Some, some, yeah. yeah. So they they didn't even release the high quality stuff. So even if you sh- took photos, who knows? Unless you somehow thumb get them out them. yourself, yeah, smuggle oh, them oh. out. Yeah. <laughs> 100% would have thumb-drived it. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> it would have been distributed yeah, pretty well, too. Yeah, yeah. But here's the thing, though. Everyone would have said they're fake. You know, it yeah. doesn't even matter. Everyone said, oh, those are fake. That's Photoshop. You know, we hear it all day long on our show, and everyone's so skeptical by nature. And you have to get to a place where, like, you can you have to understand that the story of humanity and, and the story of the Old Testament into the New Testament is it's a pretty wild story. Mm-hmm. You know, the son of God comes down to, to rescue humanity and reclaim it, give it back to his father. I mean, it's a wild story. And I don't know why we get so skeptical in this culture, in this day and age, yeah. but we do. And even if you had photos, man, I don't think they'd be enough for most people. But I, but. I would say that the, I think the paradigm's starting to shift, though. I mean, we talk about this all the time, like the sort of the because there are phones on everybody's little microcomputer they carry around in their pocket. You know, it, you can't can up the narrative, right? This is what we see this with with the you know congressional hearings on UAPs and and sort of this recognition that the the things that are becoming out of the control of the people that want to control the narrative for for a lot of a lot of things. And so I I, I think that it's starting to I think it's a sign of the times in some ways, but I, and I think maybe the veil and it, it, as people say is thinning and people are seeing more creatures and seeing you more things and because mm-hmm. we have the ability to record it although very blurry nate most often yeah or it feels like life is a theater and they're like they can figure out the character like like whatever's being told to me is not true it's all mm-hmm. it's so many people are act there's so many actors right. you know so they they want to know people want to mm-hmm. know now because they just don't buy whatever they're being told right because it all feels everything feels contrived yeah, yeah. everything yeah, does but Shane, man, I appreciate you coming on Blurry Creatures and telling your story, man. What do you say to skeptics? My last question, like, how do you, I guess you really can't, you know, convince them, but I, I wonder if you if you have been able to rattle some minds by, with your story. And Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, obviously there's a certain level of skepticism is good, but as the Bible discusses, you know, if, if you have three witnesses and two of them are saying one thing, you know, you, you should give it some weight. Right. And so if there's multiple stories talking about the same thing and, and stuff, you know, to me, it it seems logical. Like I'm a very logic based person, and I think that's why I struggled with this so much because it defied all the logic that I knew at that in my young 18 year old mind. But if you actually look into stuff and you see consistency and go into it with an open mind, I think you'll 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 recognize the truth when you see it. Definitely helped me in my story because I again I didn't believe myself for for the longest time until I was validated by other people like, hey man, yeah, there's this story. Check out this story. Look at this, and mm-hmm. yeah, there's crazy stuff going on everywhere. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and shout out to Tales from the Grid Square for providing a place for you to tell your story and, and introducing us and allowing us to connect and you to come on here and tell your story to a lot of people. And we have a pretty big audience. So it's growing every every month, and more and more people pack it in and want to hear the, the the blurry creatures that are out there so man just shout out to tales from the grid square and nick go support him grab his book and shane thank you so much for being willing to come on our podcast and uh, share your encounter yeah, absolutely yeah. thank you guys for um, having me i really appreciate it cool yeah we're just a couple guys who want to ask questions and we're not afraid to get weird so the better and, answers <laughs> man that's all the better answers yeah well yeah man and then uh anyone out there if you've if you've, if you've caught anything on your thermal scope or if you've been in the military you've seen something shoot us an email blurry creatures podcast at gmail.com thank you so much for yeah. coming on our show and yeah, yeah. appreciate you. absolutely thanks guys yeah if and then we'll shoot you uh we'll shoot you an email let you know when this when this is coming out and then i'll shoot you an email say if you want a shirt or something we can we can shoot you out some merch as well we like to, like to take uh, care yeah, of our people cool. that spend it you know we took you you spent some of your valuable time with us so we'd like to send you out something to uh you know, something you could just you could work in the yard in, man. It's not anything special, <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, we'll do that as well. So, thanks, Shane. Thank you. Yeah.